This video is sponsored by Magic Spoon. I've been seeing a lot of people hate on the new MCU Eternals film, and don't get me wrong, I certainly have my fair share of critiques. It's long, it's clunky, and it's overly reliant on these rambly, sometimes incomprehensible exposition dumps. So it's probably exactly what Jack Kirby would have wanted. The biggest critique that I have is that it's visually boring. I can't think of a scene from this film that stands out as a treat for the eyes. Now, Marvel has often taken the French omelet approach to cinematography, right? Like, if it has even a hint of color, you've done it wrong. But Eternals falls especially flat for me because the source material is this. These vibrant, intricate, and almost unwieldy images represent the raw creative power of Jack Kirby's mind channeled directly into his pencil. Does it always work? No. <laughs> but a lot of fans seem to praise the comics for the art alone, ignoring the story and basic premise, which is bad. The Eternals comics are bad. But okay, let's back up for a second. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and throughout the 1940s through the 1960s, seminal comics creator Jack Kirby helped create some of the most iconic heroes there were, like Captain America, Iron Man, Hulk, Thor, the X-Men, and the list of characters goes on so long that it literally has its own Wikipedia page. But then in 1970, after suffering year after year of uncredited and sometimes unpaid work, Jack Kirby does the unthinkable. He leaves Marvel Comics to join its main competitor, DC Comics. At DC Comics, Kirby was allowed full reign to do basically whatever he wanted, creating new characters, reinventing storylines for existing characters, and generally just getting weird with it. In comics like The New Gods, he'd tell sprawling, complex narratives of impressively cosmic beings. Now, these comics weren't for everyone, but if you were into it, you were into it. As this Jimmy says right at the top, don't ask, just buy it. But you see, the problem with telling a grand, complicated saga, as Kirby often wanted to do, is that if a reader fell off and missed even one or two issues, it would be unbelievably hard for them to jump back on and still understand what's happening. So in 1971, when DC changed the price of their comics from 15 cents to 25 cents, a lot of readers thought, wow, that is a lot of money. I can't buy every comic that I want to buy. So some of them, unfortunately, have to fall to the wayside for a little bit here. And eventually when DC Comics lowered their price back down, it still wasn't enough to get people to want to jump back into these comics. They had missed so many issues, they wouldn't be able to understand what's happening at this point. It would be nearly impossible to keep up with the intricate intergalactic tales that Kirby was weaving. So sales of Kirby's comics diminished and they never really fully recovered at DC. And because of that, DC Comics kept canceling any new comic book that Jack Kirby would create. I mean, we all remember Jack Kirby's Dingbats of Danger Street. You know, the comic that lasted exactly one issue before DC was like, wait, what? So five years went on with Kirby at DC, canceled title after canceled title. But eventually Kirby's contract with them was up. Meanwhile, Marvel was awaiting the return of their prodigal son and made him an offer saying that he could write, edit, uh, draw, do anything that he wanted to do if, the, if he came back to them. Reportedly, Kirby felt incredibly depressed that the only legitimate two options that he could take to further his career were for the two biggest companies in this space that both devalued and demoralized him. But he did ultimately decide to return to Marvel in 1975, and it's under this context specifically that Jack Kirby wrote The Eternals. In a nutshell, The Eternals comic is about how a race of cosmic beings known as the Celestials came to Earth and experimented on the life there. In their experiments, they created Eternals, cool things, deviants, bad things, and humans, 
also bad things. As their name suggests, the Eternals don't die normal deaths typically and can basically live on forever and ever, which is what they've been doing, fighting the Deviants for thousands of years. And because the Eternals have cool powers, are hard to kill, and fight epic battles, onlooking humans have been inspired by their feats and stories and have crafted entire mythologies around them. Most of them can be found in Greek mythology like Circe, Icarus, Thena, and Ajax, with the occasional Roman or Sumerian myths like Makar and Gilgamesh, respectively. The comic series opens with the Celestials making their rounds to visit Earth and see what's up. They've not been around for a couple millennia, so just a few things have changed. Icarus, who's been in hiding as a human named Ike Harris, which is, you can do better than that. He has to reunite with the rest of the Eternals to not only fight off the Deviants, who are back on the attack, but also defend Earth from Erishim. The big red celestial, who will judge Earth to see if the planet is worthy of continuing to spin on, or if it's time to treat Earth like a bad haircut. You know, just get rid of it all, start fresh. I constantly have had bad haircuts in the past, which is why I look like this now. If Kirby's work on the new gods over at DC Comics was a story about the old gods falling and new ones coming up to take their place, then Eternals was a spiritual successor to it, asking the question, what if the original gods, the Celestials in this case, what if they returned? And you can kind of see exactly how Kirby was feeling about his own career path in this moment. I mean, Jack Kirby helps build Marvel, leaves Marvel, and then comes back to Marvel to write a story about gods returning to a world they helped create? And even though these gods had initially inspired others and had been the subject of praise and adoration once before, the world has seemingly moved on and forgotten about them. What I'm saying is, it's not hard to see why Jack Kirby was inspired to tell this story specifically given his personal life experiences. He was never the most subtle writer when it came to hiding the things that inspired his work. Heck, one of the initial titles for the series was going to be Return of the Gods. They even mocked up an entire cover for it, ready to hit print, but... Uh, they rapidly had to change course and come up with a totally different name. See if you can spot why. This is the rejected cover. Notice anything familiar about it? If you said no, then good. You've lived a normal, naive life, and I can trust you. You see, this textural logo on the cover here was just a little too similar to the cover of a book that came out just a couple years earlier. A book that has left a massive impact on the world that is still being felt to this day. Is it a good impact? Well, so before we dive into some historical drama, I have to give a massive shout out to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Emily and I keep a constant supply of cereal in our home for breakfast or lunch or really just any meal, sometimes desserts. We are cereal fiends. So when Magic Spoon reached out and said that they wanted to send us some cereal, I said, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we can find some room for it. I had no idea they were gonna send us this many boxes. If you've never heard of Magic Spoon before, they make cereal that is reminiscent of that colorful, sugary cereal that you would eat as a kid, but without any of that sugar. In fact, it has zero grams of sugar. Magic Spoon is also high in protein with 13 to 14 grams of protein and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. They're also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free, if that matters to your dietary needs. I just think it tastes good. I think it's just good cereal. My favorite flavor is the frosted cereal. It tastes like toasted marshmallows to me, which is not a flavor of cereal that I thought I needed in my life, but now I I can't, I, I can't live without it. And right now, Magic Spoon is having their best offer yet for Black Friday. If you click the link in the description, you can get 20% off your order. Grab a variety pack of their delicious cereal and try it today. And hey, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it comes with a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Also for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon ships to the UK and Canada. So click the link below and use the code NerdSyncBF for 20 off or go to magicspoon.com slash nerdsyncbf to get their best offer yet. This offer isn't going to get any better before it ends on Cyber Monday, so go check it out. Link in the description. Get yourself some Magic Spoon cereal. Once again, I highly recommend the frosted one. Thank you so much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring. Now let's get back to the video. Okay. 
So, Eric von Daniken is a Swiss author who struck surprise gold with his book Chariots of the Gods? Question mark? In 1968. In this book, von Daniken outlined a hypothesis that looking at technology and mythology of ancient civilizations, there appears to be a pattern indicating that extraterrestrials came to visit humans in the past. These ancient astronauts performed miracles using advanced technology wildly beyond the comprehension of humans at the time. In our misunderstandings by our feeble minds, we mistook these alien visitors for gods and created entire myths and cultures centered around them. Von Daniken gave various examples, from the creation and implementation of the Egyptian pyramids to the mysteries surrounding the stone heads of Easter Island. And he didn't stop at technological wonders. He claimed to see the influence of aliens in human art and religious scripture, such as the genuinely bizarre vision recounted by the biblical prophet Ezekiel, where he witnessed strange creatures descending from a brightly lit cloud of smoke that Von Daniken theorizes was Ezekiel's interpretations of aliens riding around in their spacecraft, making for the strange strangest episode of Veggie Tales I've ever seen. Ezekiel saw the wee the the way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wee the way in the middle of the air. Chariots of the Gods is, to say the least, controversial. Academics have dismissed its claims as poorly thought out and making wild leaps of logic. It's also been accused of plagiarizing from works of fiction. But that hasn't stopped this book or even the subsequent books that Von Daniken wrote from becoming significant bestsellers and inspiring an entire community of ancient astronaut theorists that is still prevalent today. Think about it. When the book came out in the late 60s, humans were just about to land on the moon. People were interested in space and what lay out there. Furthermore, a generation of young baby boomers in the West was amidst a significant cultural shift. People were interested in exploring new and esoteric ways of understanding the world. It led to a resurgence of spiritualism and appropriated spiritual understandings of the cosmos, often called the New Age movement. And chariots of the gods? Well, New Agers found Von Daniken's ideas fascinating. And on top of that, the culture of studying UFO sightings was becoming more and more prominent. Are we truly alone in this universe? Or will we ever find alien life out there someday? Or perhaps, perhaps they've already found us millennia ago. These ideas spread like wildfire in American culture during the 70s, even inspiring a series of articles in the National Exaggerator. No kidding! No way! It even prompted NBC to release a one-hour special in 1973 called In Search of Ancient Astronauts, narrated by Rod Sterling of The Twilight Zone. If we accept the premise that beings from another civilization visited here ages ago, then some of the mysteries of our past take on a new and startling light. We have only fragments. But look up into the sky some clear starlit night and allow yourself the freedom to wonder. And it wasn't long until other authors got in on the fun that Von Daniken was having. In 1976, Russian-American author Zechariah Sitchin released The Twelfth Planet, which claimed that a group of deities from ancient Mesopotamian texts known as the Anunnaki were actually an advanced extraterrestrial species who came to Earth and created humans through genetic experimentation. And hey, doesn't that sound familiar? And look, I know references to the Anunnaki because of Scooby-Doo lore, of all things. The Anunnaki have a great history of helping humans, but we have no physical form and must inhabit animals. This is why some animals, our descendants, can talk and others cannot. But 
this video is about Eternals. So we're talking, it sounds like, it sounds like they're talking about the Celestials. 1976 was the same year that Jack Kirby's Eternals hit the stands, and we can see more than a few influences that both Von Daniken and Sitchin had on this comic series. Continuing with the Anunnaki angle, Sitchin claimed that the Anunnaki were forced to temporarily leave the planet in orbit around Earth after Antarctic glaciers started melting, which caused the Great Flood. In issue number two of Eternals, it's explained that the Deviants challenged the Celestials to a battle, and the Celestials won by using their advanced technology, conjuring up tidal waves the size of mountains that drowned the land and all that lived upon it. Meanwhile, the Eternals built a big boat to keep humans and animals safe from this great flood. Hey, look, Jack Kirby, you can make homages all you want, but I recognize the plot of Evan Almighty when I see it. The Celestials also battled the Deviants with what appears to be massive nuclear weaponry. As it's described in the comic, quote, its terrible power shook the world. Its fires leapt from one continent, it says leaped, but it should be leapt, from one continent to another and turned them into blazing suns. And some ancient astronaut theorists do genuinely believe that wars were fought with nuclear weapons thousands and thousands of years ago. There are descriptions of people affected by objects known as Brahma weapons in the Bhagavad Gita, whose explosions were said to be brighter than a thousand suns, setting entire swaths of land on fire. Coincidentally, although some ancient astronaut theorists would probably say it's definitely not a coincidence, the Bhagavad Gita was famously quoted by Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer after the United States set off the first nuclear bomb tests. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. All of this is just barely scratching the surface, but you can see the hallmarks of ancient astronaut theory present in Jack Kirby's Eternals. You just take an ancient text or artifact or landmark and you ask the simple question, but what if it was aliens though? I mean, it's spelled out right from the start of this series. Mythology is just outer space technology translated in terms that humans can understand. Like the Eternals opens in an ancient Incan city where there are numerous grand statues depicting the Celestials. Alien visitors with highly advanced technology rendered in the stylings of Incan carvings. They even discover technology that was far more advanced than what the Inca people should have been capable of at the time. Icarus explains that the revelation they are uncovering is, quote, the true story of all which has gone before. We are not alone in this universe. We never were. And cultures from the past, like what's represented in this story, left pieces of the puzzle for us to put together. And you know that final showdown of Kirby's run ends in the only place it ever could, a pyramid. People are nuts about those big triangles. So, from the outset, undeniably so, the entire premise of Jack Kirby's Eternals was based on this ancient astronaut theory that Von Daniken and others were peddling at this time. That's why this initial comic book cover design was rejected by Marvel's legal team. They were worried that the logo and the basic premise of the comic would be way too close to Von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods and open them up to lawsuits. Now, according to longtime Kirby collaborator and author of Kirby King of Comics, Mark Evan Yeh, I'm gonna keep saying it that way because it sounds fancy. It was unclear if Jack Kirby ever really bought into these conspiracy theories. Quote, it was a speculation that had long interested Jack, even if he didn't accept it as probable. In a playful mood, he'd argue, can you prove that it couldn't have happened that way? I'm a guy who lives with a lot of questions. I say, what's out there? Who's got the answers? I sure would like to hear the ultimate one, but I haven't yet. And you know what? Any other day, I would willingly dive down into the rabbit hole of ancient astronaut theory to try and answer Jack's question, but I am a little too impressionable. Plus, my conspiracy days are over after that whole Bob Ross thing. So to make my job easier, I called upon my friend, fellow YouTuber, and actual historian Tristan Johnson from Step Back History to help me explain why ancient astronaut theory is so garbage and why Jack Kirby should feel bad for basing an entire comic book series around it. 
Hey, Tristan, Scott here. Really quickly, uh, are you familiar with the Eternals comics? It's basically this idea in Marvel that aliens visited Earth ages ago and inspired them with their presence and uh, their advanced technology. Ancient astronauts? You mean like, like ancient aliens, like the show on the History Channel? Come on, Scott, you're better than this. No historian or archeologist takes anything that's said on that show seriously. It's always working backwards from a conclusion and making all sorts of great leaps in logic to fit history into their preconceived notion. Trust me, if there was evidence that was falsifiable that proved that there were aliens who visited Earth in the past and you discovered it, you would be the most famous archeologist on Earth. You'd have basically made your career. The evidence that's usually put forward is either an extreme stretch of logic or it's just a hoax. I'd actually like sometime to do like a podcast or something where I debunk each of these theories one by one. I'm sorry. Hi, Sparta. Tristan, are you telling me that there's an entire series about this concept and it's on the reputable History Channel? No, Scott, that's not what I want you to get out of this. So I've just watched all 17 seasons of Ancient Aliens and I finally get it. Also, we didn't have tinfoil to fashion hats out of, so I'm substituting parchment paper. I hope this does the same thing. In 2009, History Channel aired a two hour special called Chariots, Gods, and Beyond, a clear homage to Von Daniken's work. In fact, here's the boy right here in the pilot episode itself. What a get. Chariots of the God was full of speculation. I had 238 question marks. Nobody read the question mark. They always said, Mr. Von Däniken is saying, and I did not say, I asked the question. When I first read Chariots of the Gods, I couldn't put that book down because it answered a whole bunch of questions. The documentary was a surprise hit and spun off into its own show called Ancient Aliens, which quickly became History Channel's flagship series, effectively revitalizing the ancient astronaut theory that was so prevalent in the 70s. And it's not hard to see why. Historical places and artifacts that might secretly be clues to unlock a new radical understanding of the world and reality as we know it? Yes, please. I love National Treasure and Indiana Jones, except for the fourth movie. But I do like that one now, actually, because it has ancient aliens in it. Yay. I think what grabbed me first about this show is that it seems to be narrated by the world's most defensive man. Millions of people around the world believe we have been visited in the past by extraterrestrial beings. Hey bud, you don't have to start out immediately with millions of people believe this actually, okay? It's not just me. You don't have to convince me, I'm with you. The show is predominantly written by David Childress and produced by Giorgio Tsoukalos, you know, the meme guy, AKA my personal hero. They make appearances in nearly every episode with lots of other experts who even use science to prove that their claims are in fact real. That's spooky. They found this ancient Egyptian bird toy and put it through a wind tunnel to prove that it's not a bird, but a model airplane. I mean, it wouldn't actually work as an airplane unless you added some additional parts to it to make it into an airplane. The only thing preventing the Saqqara bird from achieving flight was the lack of a rear stabilizing rudder. But it turns out that if you add airplane parts to things, they function like airplanes. So I think that proves that theory. That's spooky. Yep, ancient Egypt had airplane technology given to them by who else? Aliens. And the proof is in this one model airplane toy that isn't a bird, it's an airplane. Have archeologists found real full scale ancient airplanes in Egypt yet? No, but they're still looking, give them time. Egypt's a big place. That's why they needed airplanes. No, you're not gonna ruin my fun this time, Tristan. Look, people hate on this show for what they see as History Channel legitimizing far-fetched evidence-free pseudo-archaeology, but as long as they keep taking little trinkets and putting airplane parts on them, which they do a lot. Once completed, the remote-controlled flyer took off down a makeshift runway and flew. How can I not trust them? This is applied science. This isn't just thinking somewhere. I agree. There's just so much evidence out there. And Jack Kirby even worked in the most famous examples into 
his Eternals comics. Also good news, Emily returned from the store with tinfoil and then promptly left after she realized why I needed it. Does it matter if it's the shiny side or the flatter side? Oh, I've got like a side part going on with the tin foil. Oh, that's this takes me back to one, my scene kid days. This is what I used to look like. I just get rid of it all, start fresh. I used to do that hair flip thing all the time. Ugh. 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 Anyway, at the beginning of Eternals issue number two, Kirby starts our perspective up high in the sky, looking down over the terrain where this ancient Incan civilization has carved strange lines into the ground that go on for miles. Some are straight and geometric, while others are in the shapes of animals. These are clear homages to the Nazca Lines, enormous geoglyphs cut into the soil of the Nazca Desert in Peru. Miles and miles of lines running straight across the landscape with some figurative designs of plants and animals as well. The most bizarre thing about these lines is that according to ancient aliens, you can't see the full scope of them from the ground. They're just too massive. You can see them only from the air. That could be signs of, hello up there, here we are, it's something. People in the 20th century eventually rediscovered them only when Peruvian pilots looked out of their airplanes to see these designs in the ground. And this raises massive questions. If you can only see these designs from the sky, then who were the Nazca people making these for? Were they trying to impress aliens that were hovering above Earth in their spacecraft with these artistic designs? Or perhaps were these straighter lines actually runways for ancient aircraft that aliens gifted to these folks? The lines look like airstrips. It looks like an airport, and it really does. Most of Ancient Aliens is about airplanes, I'm discovering. Hello? Hey, Scott, it's Tristan. Again, I just need you to know that while we aren't totally certain what the Nazca people use the lines for, we have a decent idea how they made them using this ingenious idea called planning. You can make a picture without seeing the entirety of it yourself, like say, making an image from connecting dots or typing in formulas in a graphing calculator to make a meme. You just need to plan it out. Also, the region where the Nazca lines are has hills where you can see the images from the ground. You don't need to be flying through the air to see them. Ancient astronaut theories like this tend to dismiss the ingenuity and capability of ancient people. Past civilizations could absolutely accomplish difficult, impressive things without an alien being necessary. Hey, this sucks. So Tristan may have ruined that one for me, but the Nazca lines are far from the only thing that Jack Kirby took from ancient astronaut theory to put in his Eternals comics. At the start of issue one, archeologists discover these incredible otherworldly statues and carvings that depict beings controlling ancient spacecraft. This is notably similar to a discovery made in the Mayan city of Palenque, where the sarcophagus lid of one King Pakal appears to depict him sitting in and piloting an advanced rocket ship He's controlling levers and buttons with his hands and feet. He's wearing a special breathing apparatus like a spacesuit. And the bottom of the carving even has rocket exhaust fumes, like the king is taking off to the stars. We have maintained for a very long time that the depiction here is of King Pakal sitting in some type of a spacecraft. Ancient aliens even recreated this carving in full three-dimensionality by a trusted expert who would never take liberties with such an important assignment. At the bottom of the Palenque slab, you see something like the it looks flames. Like, it looks like fire. And, exactly. And I, I had to do a little interpretive. I, I put engine bells on instead of the flame, of but course. that's the thruster stage. I had to do a little interpretive. I, I mean, you just can't refute that. Scott, Scott, I, I, I've never hijacked a radio signal before, but I hope this works. I probably don't have much time. Look, Pakal's tomb lid only vaguely looks like any space age technology. I can tell you though what it does look like, a tomb lid. Trained archeologists have studied Pakal's coffin lid and it has many aspects in common to Maya art referring to passage into the afterlife. You know, what might wind up on someone's Coffin? A thing from the past 
kind of sort of resembling something from a completely different modern day cultural perspective does not an ancient alien make. Plus, that model maker is probably an expert in the field of making cute sculptures, but he's likely not a credited scholar in the field of Mayan history and culture. It's a trick they do often. Ancient Aliens loves bringing in experts from fields as if they are scholars on actual archaeology, but they got even lazier here. This guy is simply labeled in the lower thirds as a quote-unquote researcher without explaining much else. Anyone can be labeled as a researcher. Also, hey, debugging this stuff over the radio is kind of like doing a podcast. Remember that podcast thing I was talking about? Maybe you'd be interested in doing... I think what Tristan meant to say was... There's major evidence that prove that ancient aliens visited Earth in the past. Also, there's snow one. better than Scott. Thank you, real Tristan. And there's loads more evidence to point to, even still. Like, the Eternals comic explains how the Celestials wiped out entire civilizations, just like how ancient aliens explains that the Mayan people disappeared because of a secret alien plot. And remember the Noah's Ark storyline? There's loads of theories that aliens were actually behind stories from the Bible. Jonah wasn't swallowed by a whale, he fell on board an alien submarine. Manna from heaven that ancient Jews survived on for 40 years while wandering the wilderness? Uh, that was algae-based food made by alien nuclear-powered replicator technology. The Ark of the Covenant was a miniature nuclear reactor. That's why it melts your face off when you open it. Tristan is no longer here, and I am unstoppable. Telegram for Mr. Nice Wonder. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's me. Thanks. Dear Mr. Nice Wander, you are talking way too fast, and it takes a long time to handwrite all of this. Ancient Aliens does this too, where they move from subject to subject, implying connections and not giving you any time to think critically or evaluate any of the claims they're spouting. By the time you've got Google up, they're on to the next thing. Please try to avoid doing this in the future. Warmest regards, Tristan. P.S. I'm serious about that podcast idea. It would... Yeah. Yeah, okay. We should probably put all this conspiracy stuff away before we go down that road a little too far. We've been sort of dancing around this for the entirety of this video so far, but perhaps the grossest thing that ancient aliens and ancient astronaut theory does is start with the presupposition that ancient civilizations were incapable of making anything cool or technologically impressive or artistically interesting without the help of aliens. Like, it's more believable to ancient astronaut theorists that literal aliens visited Earth and influenced ancient cultures from the past than it is for them to believe that those ancient cultures could be rad all on their own. Which is already bad enough, but the thing is, they're not exactly applying this logic evenly across the board. Ancient astronaut theory focuses mostly on cultures in Africa, South and Central America, and Asia. Basically, any civilization that wasn't in Europe. These theorists will gladly call into question the true origins of the pyramids or the Easter Island Moai statues or intricate Mayan sarcophagus lids, but no one's asking these same questions about European landmarks like the Colosseum or the Parthenon or this mysterious obelisk that somehow knows what time it is no matter when you look at it. Stonehenge is about the only European landmark I can think of that's called into question by ancient astronaut theory, but even Eric Von Daniken, the father of it all, really just glossed over it in Chariots of the Gods, choosing instead to speculate almost entirely on non-white civilizations. So either aliens just didn't bother visiting white people, or ancient astronaut theory starts with the base assumption that if a society's skin color was even a little bit darker than toast on the first setting of a toaster, 
it was impossible for them to have any kind of artistic or technological achievements without the help of literal alien visitors coming to instruct them. To clarify, it is easier for ancient astronaut theorists to give all of the credit to aliens than it is for them to give an ounce of credit to black or brown people. And I don't even have the time or stomach to get into Von Daniken's second book, Signs of the Gods, in which he went full mask off racist, describing black people as a failed alien experiment. And I just, I wanna be clear here. If you have believed or still currently believe in the ideas behind ancient aliens, I'm not calling you a racist. I'm not calling you a bad person. I'm not even calling you a fool for, for falling for any of this. Speaking personally, I think it would be really cool if there was other life out there in the universe. And I carry that bias with me when I watch clips from ancient aliens, and that makes some of their claims seem more believable to me because I want it to be true. I want there to be alien life out there. And that makes their arguments more convincing than they actually are. As we've seen, the show Ancient Aliens uses a lot of devious tactics to make its almost laughably easy to disprove theories seem even more credible. Taking objects out of their cultural contexts, using experts in unrelated fields to pretend to be experts in archaeology, saying a lot of really weird shit super fast so you don't get time to think about what you just heard. Were the ancient prophets really able to access incredible information from a hidden dimension? Is it really possible that the Nazis unlocked the secrets of time travel during their expedition in Tibet? Might the dinosaurs have been the target of extermination. That's spooky. In other words, don't ask, just buy it. But another nefarious thing that we've not talked about yet is how the original History Channel special had at least some dissenting voices from actual archaeologists discrediting these theories. There is not a single piece of evidence that Von Daniken puts forward that cannot be attributed to human ingenuity, technology, and development. Can we liken Ezekiel's chariot to a UFO? The ancients use myth and metaphor and images to describe their experience of God. We can gain insight by reading the Old Testament and reading about Ezekiel's chariot, but it's not to draw a strict analogy between his chariot and a UFO. Why do we have to believe that these simply could not be an expression of an artistic impulse, you know? Is it really that outlandish to believe that, you know, uh, that, that, that these natives in, in Peru might have wanted to create some large-scale work of art? And, and to say that, that such a large-scale work of art could not have been created merely for the possibility of having created it, rather than the Nazca lines are so inhumanly vast that they could only be admired by people who are capable of flight. Heck, even that NBC special from the 70s ended with a young Carl Sagan saying this. The question arises, might there have been a visit to the Earth in historical times? There are popular books on this subject. Um, it's an idea which people find exciting. It's a kind of, mm, scientific justification of theological belief, which people would rather believe uh, uh, in any case. Uh, it's kind of modern dress for old time religion. Well, what about that? Is, it, is that possible or not? I can only say that you can't exclude the possibility, but there's not a smidgen of evidence that is compelling. Unfortunately, every episode of Ancient Aliens after the pilot does away with these folks. The show goes out of its way to label the differences between mainstream archaeologists and proponents of ancient astronaut theory. Mainstream archaeologists theorize that the Great Pyramid was built sometime around 2500 BC as the burial tomb of the pharaoh Khufu. But this claim has yet to be proven. Were the dinosaurs killed off by a cosmic natural event? as mainstream scientists believe. According to mainstream historians, mainstream archeologists, mainstream scholars. Subtly implying in so many words that buying what ancient astronauts is selling sets you apart from the mainstream. It makes you a skeptic, a free thinker. But the ultimate irony is that the show is manipulating you. 
why is a show like Ancient Aliens on the History Channel, right? Like you would think that only the most reputable information and sources would be on such a platform. But History Channel isn't exactly a nonprofit trying to educate people through the power of television. That's PBS. That's what PBS is. And Bob Ross would never try to convince you that aliens exist. He's too busy painting happy clouds. You can end up with great big cotton balls in the sky if you're not careful. I guess I'd be considered a UFO, big cotton ball in the sky. That is not helpful, Bob. My point is, the more eyes that History Channel can get on its shows, the more ads it can sell, and the more money it can make. Your attention is valuable. And what do you think gets more attention? A docuseries about an ancient civilization as credible historians have understood it for years, or a show about an idea that's radical, wildly outlandish, and packaged in a format that's irresistibly memeable. Were these dragons truly dragons? I would argue pretty confidently that the latter is a much more attention-grabbing concept. And Jack Kirby knew that. And again, I know that Kirby never really seemed to legitimately buy into the idea of ancient astronaut theory. And to be clear, I'm for sure not blaming Jack in any capacity for spreading around the ideas of Von Daniken and others, right? Like Chariots of the Gods was already a super popular book before the Eternals came out. And it's not like the Eternals have ever been a, a hot property for Marvel. I'm pretty sure they didn't even realize that they owned the Eternals until earlier this year. But whether he believed in ancient aliens or not, he still recognized the idea and made an entire superhero comic about it. And to once again make an enormous clarification here, I'm definitely not saying that you are a bad person if you like the Eternals. That would be absurd. I like the Eternals. Well, you know, some parts I could live without, but we could at least recognize that the basic premise behind it is steeped in a foundation of lies and racism. And the novelty of Ancient Aliens has made it last for 17 seasons. I believe an 18th season is currently being filmed. It has been on the air for as long as Grey's Anatomy, an equally awful show. Let Meredith die. <laughs> because the sad part about this system that we live in is that a dollar made educating you and a dollar made manipulating you. They're worth exactly the same. What's easier, you think? So about that podcast you wanted to start. So do you want to debunk some ancient aliens conspiracy theories with me? Only if the show's called It's Probably Not Aliens and we release new episodes every Tuesday starting two months ago. Perfect. I imagine we're available on every major podcast platform, including Google, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And a rad Twitter account that people can follow for updates. All links in the description. For sure. I've got some very fun and sad episodes planned. <laughs> oh boy. But actually, this is a real podcast that we are currently making, so please go seek it out and listen to it and leave a good review and subscribe to all the places it would mean the world to me. Thank you. Thank you so much to Tristan from Step Back History for helping with this video, and thank you so much for watching it. And I'm sorry I used the Eternals to mostly talk about how much I don't like ancient aliens. If you're new here and you actually want like comic book reviews and storyline recaps, uh, that's not what I do here. You can find many great channels on YouTube that do that sort of thing. But if you want deep dives into the real world history, culture, and art behind your favorite nerdy media, then hey, welcome to NerdSync. 
I would love it so much if you subscribe so you don't miss anything like this in the future. And if you feel extra generous, uh, feel free to throw some money my way over on Patreon, just like A Filthy Casual, Amanda Trisdale, BKBW, C. McCartney Smith, Christopher Lang, DeCassowary, Donna Bark, Edwin Latour, Eric Ketchum, Eric Totora Pato, Everett Parrott, Jonathan Roscoe, Jack Fien, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lenowski, Julian Lozell Latour, I'm so bad at this, Casper Sieg, Mar Sottledean, Marisa Wilson, Pete Temple, Silva Donut, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. Tristan and I made another video together a while back about Superman's depressing history with nuclear weapons. Go watch that if you want something cheery, or here's a playlist of my best hits if you're new here. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to explore your favorite art through curiosity and vulnerability. See ya.